Thank you very much uh, for joining this session on precision medicine. Uh, my name is uh, Tan Cho Chuan. I'm the president of the National University of Singapore. And uh, I'm a physician by training. So uh, we all know that in current medical practice, uh, what often happens in most cases is that we, uh, when a patient is diagnosed with a medical condition, we give them a standard treatment. Now, this standard treatment works pretty well for many of the patients. It works less well for others, and in some cases, it may not work at all. But the problem is, uh, in many cases, we are unable to <coughs> determine which patients might benefit and which patients may not. So we now enter an era of precision medicine, which uh, holds the potential for us to be better able to identify which patients might respond better to what kinds of treatments. But uh, the question now is, uh, what is the true promise of uh, precision medicine, how might it really change the way medicine and healthcare systems are run? And what are some of the challenges that uh, get in the way in the widespread implementation of uh, precision medicine in health systems uh, generally? So today we have a, a superb panel of uh, real experts uh, in the field who will uh, help us to better understand some of the promise as well as some of the challenges we face in the extension of precision medicine into the mainstream health system. I'll just uh, introduce them uh, briefly. We have uh, Cathy Hudson, who is currently the Deputy Director for Science Outreach and Health Policy at the, NUS, at, at the US National Institutes of Health. We have uh, Steve Rakowski, who is the uh, President and CEO of uh, Quest Diagnostics in the USA. We have Pierre Schatz, who is the CEO of Quiagen in uh, Germany, and we have Victor Zhao, who is uh, currently president of the US National Academy of Medicine. So what I'll do is uh, pose a question to each of our panelists in turn and uh, ask them to uh, give us some uh, framing ideas about uh, the key issues in precision medicine. Following that, we'll pick up some of the themes among the panelists. Then we'll love to hear your comments and questions in the Q&A that follows. So if I can start with Cathy. Cathy, you've been very much been involved uh, with President Obama's uh, declaration last year of uh, a major precision medicine initiative in the US. Mm -hmm. We uh, all know that in the past we had uh, stratified medicine, then we had personalized medicine, and now we have precision medicine. So what is precision medicine, and what do you think is the true potential of uh, precision medicine to transform the way healthcare is delivered? So I think there's probably not a lot of distinction between some of these different terms, personalized medicine, precision medicine, stratified medicine. They really all get at the same central issue, which is that for a very long time, medicine has been developed for the average patient. And yet, if we had extensive information about individuals' genetics, uh, environment, uh, lifestyle, and behavior, we would be able to have the insights to develop more targeted treatments for an, uh, uh, what ails that specific patient and not an average patient. So uh, it was uh, really exciting when the president launched this initiative. In fact, he launched this initiative as a part of the State of the Union address exactly one year ago today. So happy birthday, Precision Medicine Initiative. <laughs> um, and uh, we are now well on our way in an uncharacteristic fashion to uh, move forward to develop the research that we need in order to transform medicine. And what's been particularly exciting uh, for me about this is that it's not just about the medicine that will be transformed at the end of this initiative, but also about transforming how we do research. So really um, integral to the whole plan for how we're going to uh, ask a million or more Americans to volunteer to share their information their uh, lifestyle information, their genetic information, their electronic medical record information, other information about themselves um, in order to make that a really uh, robust research resource. Uh, in doing that, we are uh, making those participants partners with us in the design of the study, uh, committing to them that we're going to return research results to them. That's not traditionally been done in most of biomedical research. Um, and also that all of the data from this undertaking will be immediately and broadly available for all uh, biomedical researchers 
uh, around the world. So that's a really important set of goals and values that we are um, sort of baking in from the beginning. We are um, also in a hurry. Um, when we first put out our first set of funding announcements uh, a few months ago, people said, we don't have very much time to develop our applications and submit our applications to the NIH. Why are you moving so fast? And we said, well, the president was in a, a hurry. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, there's a, a single-minded focus on how much can we get done uh, by uh, a year from now uh, for obvious reasons, because the president will be walking out of the White House for the last time, and we want to have this really uh, integrated and well on its way uh, before he leaves office. So, you, so this uh, cohort will give us a lot of information. What do you hope to gather from it? I mean, what do you think would be the transformative insights that this cohort might provide? Oh, I think there's going to be a, a host of um, relationships and associations that we'll be able to determine right off the bat. So initially we'll be collecting uh, information from people in two, well we'll, we'll be um, asking for volunteers in two ways. One through healthcare provider organizations, which is sort of regular and routine for us at the NIH. Um, we'll also be asking or allowing anybody anywhere to raise their hand and say, I want to participate in this initiative. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's pretty unconventional. And it's also logistically pretty difficult, but in a time of sort of mobile <laughs> technologies and uh, other um, uh, modern technologies, I think we'll be able to do this. So right off the bat, we'll be able to get self-reported information from individuals. We'll be able to get, uh, with new interoperability of electronic medical records, we'll be able to get medical information about individuals. And I think immediately as we start to accrue the number of participants, we'll start to be able to allow interesting scientific questions to be asked. One of the things that we did in planning for this initiative was to think about how can we design this in such a way that there is interesting questions that can be asked where the answers will be of value to researchers, to the individual research participants, and to our partners in uh, the private sector. And so we really thought about a whole array of different examples. Um, pharmacogenetics is one, where already there are in the U.S. 140-some drugs where there's genetic information in the label, but how many of us actually know whether or not we have that particular variant that might make us uh, more or less likely to respond to a particular drug? We don't know. But what if we return that information to all of our participants in the cohort? We're able to validate in a large-scale way whether or not those variants really hold for all people or some people or not all people, and to be able to be a resor uh, discovery resource for additional pharmacogenetic variants. Great. So I think it's going to be a, an exciting time ahead. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I maybe move to Steve now. Steve, uh, Quest Diagnostics, of course, is a major global player in precision medicine and uh, also involved very much in clinical trials. Right. From an industry point of view, what, what do you think is the, the real promise of precision medicine? And uh, could you also say something about the, the use of data as a means of uh, personalizing treatments. Right. I mean, most of us can understand uh, clinical biomarkers or genomics mm -hmm. markers being useful to mm -hmm. identify who could uh, better benefit from a drug or not, but right. how to use data sure. to, sure. to, to, to yeah. make well, medicine more precise. Thanks, John. John and um, leveraging a little bit off what Kathy just said, uh, at Quest Diagnostics, we um, have a lot of data. As uh, people know, we have uh, a large business in the United States. Uh, we actually test about one-third of adult Americans every year. Over the course of three years, uh, we believe we have around 50 percent of adult Americans' diagnostic data. And the interesting part of that is a large part of uh, the reality of diagnostics. It represents about 2 percent of healthcare care cost. Uh, but it represents a large percentage of how decisions are made in healthcare. And uh, we now, we then take that data and we connect it with electronic medical records. So we connect with all the electronic medical records, big and small, from the Epics to the Cerners, the McKessons of the world, to the um, homegrown uh, systems that might be in hospitals. So we have that ecosystem of data and we, and we keep it for 10 years. So we have over 20 billion data points of data. And we're trying to find ways that we can utilize that data in the right way as, as a company. Uh, but we're quite interested. So when you ask uh, who would like to participate, we're interested in participating. And also, I chair the American Clinical Lab Association. So myself and 
my colleagues in our industry are quite interested of how we can participate as an industry mm -hmm. and bring the right data together because if you can combine the data together with other data, it's always more useful. And another way that we've approached it, because it's always difficult to get the historical data, we actually teamed up with a company uh, in the United States called the Novalon, and we're bringing to the point of care right now um, claims data, historical claims data that's useful to really understand the history of a patient over time. So as we think about what kind of data we want to collect, it could be useful. Uh, ways, because you asked the question how we've used it, we're actually teaming up with uh, the Center for Disease Control around hepatitis C. As you know, big issue. Uh, in the United States alone, alone, there's about 80 million uh, baby boomers that uh, have risk of having hepatitis C. We believe it's around 4 million of those baby boomers that are infected. And with that data, we can find, you know, help find uh, where we're making progress on that. But most importantly, with the expense of drugs, we all know, that uh, can now efficaciously treat hepatitis C, we can in the right way treat those patients over time. And uh, what we also found uh, in our work in drug discovery is in the past, uh, drug discovery and working with pharma has all, all been around finding the investigators. It's more important to find the patients. And by mining the data, you can be more effective and be more precise around finding the patients that you're really trying to understand the effect of a specific treatment. And then with that better selection of those patients, then be able to help affect the clinical trial to get those uh, those drugs to the market in a, in a quicker period of time. So two ways that we've engaged around this topic, but data is a big part of it. So from an industry point of view, I mean, what are the most important factors for industry players, I mean, to really participate in this effort? I mean, what would you say well, we're are the critical things? You mentioned our involvement in clinical trials, and it's an important part of this, is uh, a large part, a majority of um, clinic, uh, current drug discovery has a companion diagnostic associated with that drug. And so therefore, we're engaging with pharma to make sure we're involved early, make sure we, we have the proper assays uh, developed for that de uh, development. But then when the trial started, make sure we do the proper testing for that trial. And then as importantly, think about the commercialization. Right. And this global commercialization. So if there's a competitive diagnostic uh, associated with, with the drug, and that's really precision medicine, then we need to be able to, it, to provide the framework of deploying that diagnostic in the United States and around the world with a consistent platform, they made up with the drug. And so we're thinking your way through, how do we do that? How do we do that in the countries and how do we do that globally with pharma? Fantastic. So I can uh, now maybe move to Pierre. Uh, I mean, Kaijin, of course, is another major global diagnostic player in the world and um, also very much in, involved in precision medicine. Uh, Pierre, you also have been a very important member of the WEF's uh, Global Agenda Council on Precision Medicine. Uh, some of the things I think that Steve mentioned uh, highlight some of the challenges faced, uh, privacy, confidentiality issues, making data more interoperable and so on. Yeah. There are many challenges before precision medicine can really enter mainstream medicine and be part of the regular healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say are the most important challenges before we can really realize the potential of uh, precision medicine and see it widely used in most healthcare systems. Well, thank you, Professor Chan. It's an awkward situation to be in. I'm normally the eternal optimist, and you gave me the challenge question. <laughs> but I'll uh, try to answer it a little bit from perspective. Um, we've been in this space since about 20 years, and I'll, I'll look at it uh, from uh, the historical side. There were, in the early days, tremendous barriers for entry because uh, people didn't believe in the term personalized medicine and thought that it would be uh, uh, very difficult for pharmaceutical companies to adopt and, and would create a much smaller markets for their drugs and therefore there was a, a significant pushback. There was even a lot of pushback in um, the general healthcare community while the scientific community immediately saw that this is where we have to go. Um, the early days were indeed extremely difficult. Um, what then happened is that step by step, very, various barriers fell. So I'll take this whole also from an optimistic perspective and show where the challenges still lie. The first barriers that fell were um, the barriers on the concept. Uh, slowly, pharmaceutical companies um, recognized that there is really a tremendous opportunity to create more markets for their drugs and create better profiles in terms of quality for their drugs. If they didn't give the same drug to everybody, but differentiated drugs to specific subpopulations, so the drug looked much better 
in a competitive comparison. What then happened uh, as the next barrier that fell was that the very complex co-development of a diagnostic and a therapeutic suddenly standardized and pharmaceutical companies found development processes to align with diagnostic development timelines that are often quite different and create co-development systems that um, in the meantime are going quite well. So we today have about 20 uh, personalized medicines in the market in oncology in the United States. It's the largest market. But the more important number is that 60% of drugs in uh, pharmaceutical pipelines are actually being developed with a diagnostic as a uh, companion diagnostic. This is spectacular. So we, we don't have to push that button anymore. Where that, that train is going. The next one was the regulatory uh, barrier. And um, for many years, it was thought that adding a diagnostic to a pharmaceutical drug would delay or put at least risk onto the uh, development timelines uh, of and also opportunity for a drug. The first co-approvals were done about uh, five, six years ago. Uh, we were actually fortunate to have been part of that, where the first single gene test together with EGFR inhibitors for colorectal cancer came through and several other cancers around the same time. And um, so this, in the meantime, seems to be a solved issue. That is not the problem anymore, at least in most uh, jurisdictions around the world. So now I'm going to get to areas that are still a challenge. Um, the first is the whole reimbursement community. And um, this is uh, currently still a challenge because there are so many different pillars across the healthcare industry. And what personalized medicine does it combines several of these pillars, not only diagnostics and therapeutics, but also the providers and other constituents, and creates an ecosystem. And as soon as you do that, you're creating something that traditional payers are not really accustomed to, because normally what you want to do is to take a certain element within a pillar, let's say diagnostics, and reduce the cost and increase the efficiency or improve outcomes. This is not the case. With personalized medicine, you definitely introduce a new diagnostic, new cost, but you dramatically lower the cost in other areas, be it uh, hospital stays, for instance, uh, uh, reducing the time during which uh, therapy has to happen. So this is something that we are still looking for the right models to evaluate to say the benefit to an ecosystem is this, and this is why we will uh, also have the correct payment uh, components behind it. As an example, there is hardly a lab in the United States, and Steve will be able to um, talk to that as well, that is actually making money off genetic testing for uh, uh, the uh, uh, administration of therapies. It's, it's currently very often a loss-making proposition, and so this has to be improved. The next uh, um, barrier that still is up there is education. There was a recent uh, study by Harvard Medical School said that 36% of physicians self-reported that they don't really understand what personalized medicine is. And um, this was self-reported. So there's a lot to do, and that's why I applaud initiatives like Dr. Hudson, the NIH, and others are doing, because this is tremendously important to really understand how this can be administered and not create a quagmire uh, in terms of complexity for the various constituents. One way is to think about integrated education versus disciplines. Right now, people study genetics, uh, people study uh, medicine, should we have combined, uh, more combined education and think about educating on uh, other species as well, uh, other disciplines as well. Then the last one, data sharing. Um, why is this important? It's often talked about. Personalized medicine is working with DNA very often, which is an incredibly complex molecule. Um, there are over three billion letters in our <laughs> DNA, and variants can have so many different combinations of uh, effe effects on, uh, effect, uh, on the outcomes or the efficiency or effectiveness of drugs. So the only way we can really solve this is if we pool all the data we have to start see seeing patterns, start seeing where a drug worked, where a drug didn't work, because using rational science, we can get to certain um, uh, information, but not to all of it. So we have to pool that information to start creating this working, living ecosystem that we can mine for science and that we can apply for healthcare. And that is, you know, 30% of all medical data is stored on paper today, um, even in the United States. And we're, it's an incredibly fragmented industry. And even if digitalized, the interoperability of that data is a problem. It is not only in terms of terms, so uh, the famous one is a fractured leg and a broken leg. The two won't fit in a database. 
Uh, we're working on uh, international classifications of disease, so-called ICD-10, but also the privacy issues in the cloud. People are very often concerned about what it means for their genomes to go up to the cloud and to be mined and to pr processed and stored there. The only way for this to happen is in the cloud, and this is something that we're still working through to solve. And, and, and Victor, um, with the IOM, has, has done tremendous work in helping us now uh, separate clinical research and find new findings from actual uh, routine use of, of that genomic data. So we're, we're moving in the right direction, but it's not moving fast enough because science is moving so fast. And we should never forget that um, science is at a blazing speed years ahead of what we're even thinking about today in terms of implementing clinical practice. So there's still a lot to do, but it's a, it's a fun time. Hey, thanks, Pierre. Yeah, sorry to ask you a pessimistic question, but I thought you did extremely <laughs> well. <laughs> but I, I mean, since you brought up uh, reimbursement, I want to turn to Victor. I mean, uh, personalized medicine, you know, uh, much targeted, much better targeted therapy, it sounds really good, but uh, one of the greatest uh, concerns about most policymakers in most countries is rapidly rising healthcare costs. And also um, the need to have greater productivity in the health system that is uh, using less health professionals to do the same job. So the question is, will personalized medicine really be able to reduce costs and improve productivity in the health system? And how, how, how could it actually go about doing that? Because if we do not address this question, then uh, there'll be very little likelihood that personalized medicine become widely adopted. Well, that's certainly a question for Steve and uh, <laughs> for Pierre. Uh, I will speak from a physician perspective. Uh, at the National Academy of Medicine, previously known as Institute of Medicine, is also a health policy advisor. And uh, previously, Pierre and I were on the Global Agenda Council on Physician Medicine here. So there's a whole bunch of things I can look at. But I guess particularly I want to think about how do you implement physician medicine in the caring of the patient? And this is where I think your point is well taken because, you know, the issue is there's a lot of concern about are we adding more workload to doctors? Are we increasing the cost of care? Do you increase more complexity by adding more tests? The education issue, and are we really, at the end of the day, how do you be sure that this is implemented in a way that can demonstrate clearly that we providing better outcomes, low cost, and uh, more productivity among the healthcare providers. So, if, so I'm gonna talk about three things. One is the need for evidence. Second is adoption. And third, of course, is payers and policy. So you think on need for evidence, I think there's no question in my mind, from this point on, of course it's already happening, that all the precision medicine, diagnostic therapeutics should be put against the test of outcomes and the health economic analysis of health economics. Because without that, we are truly worried about is it gonna help the patients and we're introducing a lot of refinement, but that drives up the cost. In that context, you think about this, traditionally we think about randomized control trials, and indeed there are such trials that show certain tests and certain diet, uh, therapeutics are gonna be better than the standard of care. But that's not always the case. And if you look at how uh, diagnostics are being approved in this country and how they're paid, it doesn't always show necessarily go through the, that kind of litmus test of whether you've improved better outcomes and reduced cost. So now with what uh, Steve and Pierre and uh, Kathy said, there's this huge amount of information now we're able to collect. This information from biosensors, biomarkers, to electronic health record and the research as well as uh, the various omics allows us to have a big data to do some serious analysis whether retrospectively or prospectively about some of these promises of personalized medicine. So it should, a, a good test uh, should reduce the downstream need for testing. Uh, therefore, you're able to get to the answer faster without subjecting patients to a lot of tests and uh, talk about diagnosis. We just had a report talking about diagnostic errors, how many errors occur and how much cost 
not only to patients, but patient safety as well. But also, I believe that uh, it's essential that you think about uh, patient satisfaction as well as reduction in downstream costs. So let me give you an example. Three million US, in, uh, in the United States, three million people have symptoms of chest pain, coronary artery disease. And uh, testing to know whether they have coronary artery disease costs about $6.7 billion a year in the US. Now, many patients undergo first non-invasive imaging and then cardiac catheterization. Uh, by the way, I'm a cardiologist, that's why I use the example. So at Duke, uh, uh, you know, we actually work with the database of American College of Cardiology Cardiovascular Database. About 663 hospitals and 30,000 caths. And look at the yield of cardiac cath. You'd be amazed. Only 30% of patients with cardiac catheterization have obstructive coronary disease. <coughs> and some other reports go down as low as 10%. So imagine that you had a blood test that you can look at gene expression scoring, and such tests exist. It's actually called Chorus CAD. They demonstrated that if you were, have a patient with symptoms with known known coronary artery disease, and you have this test, a low score has a very high negative yield, which means 90-some percent of people with low score have no coronary artery disease. So if you do that test, reduce the need for imaging, need for coronary artery catheterization, and of course the risk to the patient. Now the data show that um, if you use a commercial health plan, which they did, they published, there are 23 percent fewer patients receive imaging, non-invasive, uh, non and 20 percent fewer patients underwent cath, overall resulting in a 10 percent reduction in health plan cost. That's substantial. Let me turn to, to therapeutics, because we talked a lot about diagnostics. And here, I you know, there are many examples of targeted therapy, you know, whether you're Gleevec, whatever, I, you know, antibodies to HER2. I thought hepatitis C is an interesting issue. After all, this is so controversial, right? Uh, Sovaldi, which cost about uh, $100,000 per treatment, 12-week treatment, but it really is an antiviral agent. Antiviral agent that cures hepatitis C. Yeah. So there's a lot of argument about that is going to break the bank. I think there's an analysis done to say if every Californian receive, you know, hep C treatment, they will bankrupt the, the Medi-Cal. But that being said, there's analysis look at long-term effect, downstream in terms of cirrhosis, liver transplantation, et cetera. And if you look at a 10-year period, you save actually over $300,000 from treating this patient. So it raises a lot of interesting questions, long-term, short-term issues. I want to come back to that. So let's say that we have tests and therapies that clearly show a benefit to the patient and reduce cost and uh, benefit outcome, the ones I mentioned. How do you make sure it's adopted in treatment? Physicians are overwhelmed with so many different new things. I think the important thing is being able to incorporate into evidence-based guidelines and protocols of treatment so that people adopt those things. So whether you have to do extensive education or not, I think the first thing is to make sure that's written in the guidelines. Right. Right? Once you use that, you would reduce the cost of care and the need for other diagnostics. So I think that's an important issue, and obviously reimbursement is important, but there are now with the ability to have clinical decision support tools, electronic health record, that can easily be accomplished. And it's also imp important to measure these things so that physicians who are practicing, you can see that in fact they're practicing according to the best standard of care and have incentives around those. So I say, so evidence to adoption. The final issue about policy I want to bring out is a paper we wrote in Lancet, Dana Goldman, myself, out of the GAC that we had, talking about uh, modeling in terms of health economics. And what we did is we looked at six different disease states, cancer, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, and over a span of many years. When you look at that, the 
value proposition is very different. Those who are in prevention, whether prophylactic therapy to delay the onset of cardiovascular disease to prevent it, saves a lot more money than the short-term outcomes such as cancer. So it is important, in my opinion, closing the loop in the first part of the conversation, that payers and policymakers need to think about what to encourage, what to incentivize, what to reimburse, and how to actually maximize those which will give you much greater long-term effect, saving money and better outcome than the short-term ones. So those are the things I want to talk about. It is very interesting because uh, many policymakers, uh, many payors are very focused on short-term benefits. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a question of, uh, yes, uh, in the longer term, you save the entire system money, but the distribution of those savings will vary across different constituencies and the time frame. Uh, any thoughts on how that might be addressed? Well, certainly I was saying that outside US, when you have a single payer system, that's much easier. Right because you're looking at long-term costs of care, of, uh, you know, of health care to the country. I think in our country, we're going to have to think about uh, aligning, you know, as uh, the Affordable Care Act is doing, looking at the outcomes of population, looking at disease in the continuum. When you start doing that, you recognize that you have to start thinking about savings. So instead of fee-for-service, you're looking for outcomes and value. That encourages providers to look at what tests to use, what therapies to use in order to increase savings. And that savings can be converted into incentives for the providers. Steve, please. I, I think uh, Dr. bring up an interesting point about uh, short and long term. You talk, started about hepatitis C, and I gave a real life example this year. <clears throat> in the United States, um, as you know, but just for the whole audience, we. Typically, employers self-insure large populations, so we self-insure our employees at Quest Diagnostics. So this past year, we're obviously in the testing business for hepatitis C, so we're starting to find hepatitis C, and we offer the testing to our own employees. And, and the consequence of that is we actually are now treating some of our employees. And uh, give you an example, this year, uh, it looks like our hepatitis C treatment cost at Quest Diagnostics alone, for around 60,000 people that we self-insure is about $10 million. So I think this is just the start of the discussion. That $10 million is paid by the employer. Does that employee stay with Quest Diagnostics? Will the benefit be received downstream, maybe in Medicare years, or by other employers? And, and this is just one example of short-term versus long-term and payment mechanisms. I want also to come back to uh, two questions, uh, which are important. One is the, the why now uh, question. Why do we think that uh, we are standing on a kind of a threshold where personalized medicine can really take off? Uh, why now? I mean, this uh, whole idea of personalizing medicine has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. What is it about this current time that makes us think that it's about take off? Cathy, you have any? I think there's a couple reasons. And in our discussion so far, we focused um, quite a bit out around genetics and genomics, and certainly the cost of sequencing has plummeted, um, and uh, with that makes it accessible for people to have their entire genomes sequenced and have that available for research. But that's just one technology that I think is making uh, now the right time. I, you know, when we first launched the Precision Medicine Initiative, or we're leading up to the launch of the initiative, the thing that kept me up at night was this whole issue of how do we get access to people's medical information. and. My mom, I recently moved her, and when I moved her, we moved boxes of paper records, right? Certainly, precision medicine is not going to work unless interoperability really works, and we are moving in that direction really rapidly. So I think um, health information technology, genomic technology, and you mentioned this, Victor, mobile technology, right? W what, um, what people can report about themselves and what can be passively collected with permission from individuals is a huge amount of data. So I think right now the convergence of uh, advances in those technological areas and data science um, really make now the perfect uh, time to launch this initiative. Yeah. Steve. I, I would echo that very much. Uh, I think we're, we're right now experiencing one of the most exciting times in biology I've ever experienced, and uh, it's now almost 20, uh, over 25 years. 
but the it's the intersection of biology and information technology. Um, the two have started to come together. Uh, you know, we're a company, for instance, traditionally known for machines and reagents, but few people know every second employee joining our company is actually a bioinformatician. Mm -hmm. And uh, we already have six to 700 people working on the bioinformatics area. So we're going more and more from wet to dry, as it is called. So it's called the wet lab and the dry lab. And uh, as this is happening, the two technologies that are driving personalized medicine, one, um, the understanding of genomics and the pathways and the way we can influence those, and number two, the cloud. Um, because without the ability to aggregate that data and to mine it and to process it very quickly and access the most relevant and up-to-date information within seconds, um, we will not be able to realize the promise of personalized medicine. So one of the key themes that we are evangelizing right now and there's some, some uh, significant barriers, because I'm very optimistic we'll get that done, is that it is currently not possible uh, for um, laboratories to send uh, patient data up into the cloud for processing to be able to get the most advanced and modern, uh, up-to-date uh, scientific literature be mined against that uh, set of genomic data to make good decisions in uh, further clinical practice. This is something that in many countries is just still a no-no, and um, we are working through to, um, uh, to help elucidate how important this is. Okay. Uh, Stephen, I, I think a dynamic here, too, that it's outplay more so than ever before uh, that we've ever seen is the pull from patients around the promise. <clears throat> so patients are now presenting themselves to physicians with more information than they, than they ever had before. And they've heard about the promise, and they understand treatment options. And we actually, uh, to test this, have worked with Memorial Sloan Kettering, where we've taken 34 actionable genes that you know, were primarily used in New York City around Memorial Sloan's you know, patient base, and we've taken that uh, set and we've marketed now throughout the United States to a community oncologist. It's quite the learning of trying to now explain to a community oncologist the value of this, and then also how you interpret the data when they're actually presented with a patient, not, out, not in New York City, but in what you call Kansas. It, it's, a different, it's a different challenge. So I think the patient is pulling, is pulling for this, and so I think it's creating a lot of catalyst in the system for more information and more progress. Victor? I just want to make sure we uh, look at the implementation side, as I said. Mm -hmm. And the important part is that all systems are now begin to not only have great integration in, in information through information technology, but their clinical support decision tools. So I come back to the earlier point. If a test is proven to be useful, better outcome, reduce cost, then it should be integrated into pathway of uh, care. And this way, you, we really don't even have to worry about the education piece. In many ways, it's ready to move forward, right? I still challenge my industry colleagues to say they got to meet that litmus test, which is, are you, have you put us through a health economics analysis, at least? If not, show some real tangible data to show the reduced cost, and actually, where's the outcome? Once you've got that, then I think you should be really ready to go. So in looking at the Precision Medicine Initiative, where you can bring a lot of information, research, to integrating with clinical care, to the implementation of this once you've got the evidence that they're useful. Mm -hmm. So I think time is right mm -hmm. because all the tools are there. The question is <coughs> how do we bring them all together? Fantastic. I think maybe it's time for us to uh, open up for uh, comments and uh, questions from the floor, including uh, people. Please go ahead. Can you just uh, uh, briefly introduce yourself <coughs> and, uh, before you ask the question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Bani Dugal. I represent the Baha'i International Community to the UN. <coughs> I live in New York. Um, my question is about mental health. Mm. Um, you know, with all the information we have with the Genome Project, the understanding of the brain, one would imagine that we'd have a lot more personalized medicine available uh, for mental health. Um, care, and, and I think that the panelists will probably agree that there's uh, a big divide between physical health and mental health, and could you share a little bit more about 
why that is and, and what you might be foreseeing in the near future about personalizing medi uh, medical care for mental health issues. Excellent question. I think a lot of the work now is focused on cancer, but how about <coughs> mental health? So. Let, me, let me just Please. make a, a couple comments about this issue, because I think it's particularly important in the way that we've been thinking about it for the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort, and how do we make sure that we have a diversity of, the full diversity of the United States um, as a part of our cohort. And that means that we need to be open and accessible to people of all ages and all life stages. And there are people who are going to be more difficult and probably more expensive to, to enroll into the cohort. And certainly high on that list is uh, folks who suffer from mental illness. And that touches all of us or somebody that we love, right? So, so this is really an important issue. And what I am now coming to learn <coughs> is um, how accessing medical record information, um, particularly psychiatric medical information, is going to be particularly tr problematic. Mm -hmm. So what we're, we're queuing up mm -hmm. as we start to think through the, the challenges and opportunities here is where are there, where are there policy barriers yeah. or policy opportunities that we need to, to tackle in order to make sure that we're um, open and receptive to making the cohort meaningful for uh, people with mental illness. So we're just starting to, to get into that and would be happy to, to, to talk with you and, and work with you on these issues. Please go. Oh, sorry, uh, Steve, you had. Yeah, j the whole field of uh, neurology and advanced diagnostics around neurology continues to evolve. Um, we um, actually um, have a big um, portion of our genetics business based upon advanced diagnostics for neurology related to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, and we're working with the University of California, San Francisco in that regard around dementia. Uh, the issue gets back to, uh, so now you understand you might have risk, uh, what's the clinical evidence to do something about it? Uh, and this is where we're working with the payment system to say, uh, you know, this is why we think that information has value, uh, because going back to Dr. Zell's example, if it can end the medical odyssey of why my mom or dad is not feeling well, this could have savings to the system, but we need the evidence to support that claim. Yeah. So there is a lot of progress being made. Most of the uh, large genomic programs starts off with certain disease pilots, and usually it's cancer or genetic disease, rare genetic diseases. There should be a big push towards okay, mental health. But when you reach the million uh, cohort, uh, you're obviously collecting huge amount of data. And there should be sufficient data to subset looking at mental health. The main barrier, as uh, Kathy pointed out, and in fact, is the information access and the definition of mental health and how you measure some of these things. So it's a big problem, right? I think ultimately what people love to see is that everybody gets a genome or the, uh, the omics or biomarkers measured and then it's integrated into electronic health and care and you can look at subsets and that probably you get a lot of information on mental health. But I think ultimately is how you define the phenotype is a big issue. Please go ahead. So I'm Alan Wilcox, social entrepreneur and president of Village Reach. I'm just wondering if the benefits of personalized medicine are available in the near term only to those living in high income countries, mm. or are they available to those living in low income countries, or will they simply have to wait? Please. So uh, that's an extremely important question, and I'd like to highlight when we talk about personalized medicine, uh, even in the United States, uh, the treatment of cancer is, is not predominantly done in, uh, you know, very advanced uh, academic um, uh, healthcare institutions, but uh, over three quarters is in uh, community hospital levels. Um, and um, if you go international, uh, you see an even more diverse uh, um, ecosystem of uh, people who uh, really could benefit from this. So the key thing to us, at least, has always been not only to look at the United States, um, but to immediately go, go, go global. And even developing world, there are a number of programs that um, many companies, including us, have been working on to make these new drugs available at a very manageable cost, also in the developing world, 
However, cancer is the primary target. And uh, obviously, this is not always the highest priority for a lot of these uh, countries. And as the indications are expanding, infectious disease is coming up. We talked about HCV as being a, a very important one. Uh, mental health, uh, we're working on two programs already, but out of uh, 40 programs, that's still far too few. Um, so there is, uh, there is going to be a much more diversity in this area. And I would always caution not to create systems that are only good for a very few, but um, to think about the social aspect um, and uh, to make sure that this can go global as quickly as possible. There is another dimension, which is there are some uh, inter-ethnic types of differences in uh, treatment responses. Right. So you also need to determine, say, if the Asian responses to certain types of treatment uh, differ substantially from Caucasian ones. And completely and new trials. Also yeah. impact the rollout of uh, uh, different treatments. Uh, please, you had a question. Could we have a mic over here, please? Uh, Many thanks, Annie. Indeed, the platform is open to many different users and stakeholders, mm -hmm. yeah. well, including and patients. The, and the so great thing, too, Liz, yeah. is that you know, if, if somebody generates an idea or a question by mining through this extensive data set, um, these volunteers are going to be expressing their willingness to um, re-engage or engage with uh, scientists so that you could build additional sub-studies within the cohort to answer a specific question. So, um, so I think it'll be an exciting uh, resource for idea generation. Yeah. Maybe a, a quick response from Steve, and then we'll yeah. have a comment. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of focus on the cost of, uh, of, um, of next-gen um, processing, and that cost will come down. Um, but the real value added is in finding the insight in, in the collection of the data, and in more aggregation of that data with multiple data sites, <coughs> and actually do the interrogation of the data. And, uh, this is not computer science, it's more mathematics, and it, it's interrogating the data to find the insight associated with that data, and that's where, that's where the real brilliance is, 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 is finding that insight. And when you find that insight, that, that will develop the capability of having those algorithms with more data, and then also explaining that data in a useful way for the practice of that data throughout the world is, is another important part of this. And so what we have found is even with good valid data, and with the analysis presented to a physician, is explaining that with genetic counselors and, and experts in the field, because it's just evolving so quickly, they can't keep up. So it is an important part of the value delivered beyond the computing, if you will. Yeah, quick comment from you. I would like to follow this, uh, Professor Blackburn. In all of these initiatives, I think it's absolutely key that uh, the emphasis on supporting uh, academic uh, basic research uh, should be uh, underscored. We can apply. Let us take care of this mundane translation. We need some help on the bureaucracy and all the uh, alignment of the constituents. But the only way, the reason why we're here today in personalized medicine because of your work in the academic community contributing to science and building this base. And uh, we're mining that and we're basically translating this now into improvements in healthcare. 
Um, but we've seen over the past few years that there has been an increasing trend into applied sciences from basic, and uh, we would um, greatly support, and we've been doing that very vocally, increased emphasis on basic sciences. Many thanks. Please. Thanks, Thank Luiting. The, the panelists twice mentioned the uh, problem of interoperability, and this problem exists both uh, among uh, the various uh, EHR proprietary companies and between those uh, products and uh, data extraction and statistical analysis programs. My question is what can payers such as HHS, Medicare, and other third party payers do to enhance, encourage uh, better interoperability of data? Victor, it sounds like uh, <laughs> a question directed to you. That's a tough <laughs> question to answer. I think that um, I have a feeling that the way things are progressing, the pressure will be on more and more because not only are we talking about patients within the system, but patients across systems where you need, in fact, the ability to have sharing of information. And so in many regards, I think that you can probably look at the way the payment is right now, which is looking at outcomes as a driver towards interoperability. For example, uh, frequently one would imagine that you take care of a patient in one uh, health system, that in fact the patient seeks help elsewhere, and that is a great need for interoperability to begin with. And so as you begin to look at line incentive and payment along outcomes, I think more and more pressure will be on, in fact, the vendors to find interoperability. I think the most reasons that to date they're not aligned is because the vendors, in fact, have all their proprietary approaches. We as providers can put a lot of pressure on this. And at this point, I think ultimately that may be the direction to go. I'll be interested in what you think, Kathy. So um, I appreciate the question. I, you know, we've had these waves of requirements from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in order to um, have uh, a set of incentives through CMS for interoperability. And a lot of that has been pretty simple, frankly. Uh, we n we're now into meaningful use three and uh, looking forward to new standards. For the first time, uh, certainly since I've been back at the NIH, we're really focusing on meaningful use of electronic medical records for research. And there's, this is coinciding with a real movement among inpatient patients to have access to their own data. And so the notion that people would be able to um, download rapidly and easily their own medical information, that's really putting a lot of pressure, I think, now on, on interoperability and new uh, rules coming out about data blocking. So I think there's uh, sort of a, a series of forces that are coming into play that are going to move us forward with interoperability. We are certainly not there. I was at a meeting of the Health Information Management Association, which is a big interoperable group, uh, and I had a, a problem and went to the University of California, San Francisco to a clinic and uh, was told that I could download my lab results from uh, an online system, and I sat there uh, for 45 minutes during a session on interoperability, unable to download my own laboratory results. I ended up getting a group of about a dozen uh, health information technologists, experts around, and they couldn't do it either. I finally picked up the phone and uh, called the lab. Yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> Steve. It is, a, it is evolving. Uh, so for instance, what Kathy referred to, it is a now requirement uh, in the United States that patients get access to their lab results. So we're all required as providers to serve up, if you will, that data. And so at our company, we actually, we, uh, we have developed a smart app. It's called MyQuest. And now if you have your testing done by Quest Diagnostics, you can load up the app and you can get uh, access to your laboratory results. And it also will do a historic look back on your laboratory results. Uh, so we actually have 2 million users so far in a short period of time, about 12 months mm -hmm. to get access. So again, I think the consumer and the patient is actually driving some of this. Yeah. And their interoperability is a, is a broad term. Some of this is just related to how do you communicate from an electronic standpoint. There's been a lot of work on that, that front. What Pierre has talked about earlier is common definitions and a common information model. So we could have searchable databases to really do the clinical research necessary. Right. And that's where we need to make some progress is that information, that information uh, definition. 
Okay, we have one final question uh, from back here. Please, can we have a mic? Hi, I'm Ashwin Naik. I'm a YGL and a healthcare social entrepreneur. So social entrepreneur. And coming from a world where there are not enough doctors, hospitals, and go to Alan's point about uh, affordability, uh, the discussion seems to be around precision medicine focused on individual diseases. And to me, that seems like a bigger challenge uh, unless we focus on sort of precision health, mm. right? You know, we seem to be breaking it down into individual components. Your thoughts, please. Okay. Chair? Victor? Um, <coughs> I mentioned earlier, the, uh, using the modeling of health economic analysis, there's no question prevention and the health is going to be by far better than, you know, late stage therapy. And the model is really quite impressive. You, we found that uh, over a period of multi years, you save about $600 billion if you're able to reduce just the incidence of heart disease by 50%. Right? Whereas if you look at other models and other diseases, the savings much less. So your point about prevention is critically important. Uh, but I think you, when you talk about uh, emerging economies or, you know, and low-income countries, infectious disease is a very important issue. And the ability to do a point of care diagnosis is critically important. That too should be emphasized as another way. And I totally agree with you about the health equity issue. I think that is still going to be a substantial problem in the long run. Just looking at hepatitis C drug as an example now having two pricing of two different levels in different countries you know, highlights the issue of health equity. And so I do think that there are a lot of issues to be addressed in moving this thing forward. Um, <clears throat> precision health uh, is an interesting area that uh, we're putting some thought into the value of a patient and the understanding of a patient, uh, for understanding of a patient of the value of health information from their family and making sure that they fully have a grasp of what their family history is before presenting themselves to a physician. And ye uh, yesterday we had a panel and Toby Cosgrove brought up uh, you know, op um, opportunities around prevention to get it really in the preventative side. If you think about s smoking sensation um, um, and, um, and obesity, uh, at a real personalized level, you can have an effect on some of these very expensive diseases which, which will affect differently all of us if you have a better understanding of what's happened with your family and also what you're, you're potentially subjecting yourself to based upon what you're doing in your own life. So it's a, it's a growing field and I think more content at the, at the, point, at the point of uh, interaction between the physician is something that we're looking into. Well, so, so share please, yeah. yeah, a quick sure one. I, yeah. question. I think uh, there's always this tension, at least perceived tension between precision medicine and public health. People have written about this mm -hmm. to say that, uh, in fact, it's the end of one or the other. Actually, I think they're fully aligned yep. because what I said earlier, by using the tools of precision medicine, you're looking at population risk when you look at individual risk. So you know what population or what populations are more vulnerable at greater risk, and therefore you can come in with much earlier intervention. So I think the two are aligned if applied properly, and that's the point you're making. So a very rich uh, discussion, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Maybe i just uh, summarize the three key takeaways for me. Uh, the first is the why now question, and uh, it's not just the advances in biomedical sciences, it's also the advances in data science, the ability to put data, aggregate them in the cloud, and to uh, understand more, uh, use it to understand disease better and how uh, patients can be targeted, uh, susceptible populations uh, defined, and uh, we also are seeing now a pull from patients who demand or would like to have this sort of uh, care. The second is uh, really there are many constituencies. It's a complicated uh, and challenging area. And you need evidence. And the evidence is not just of uh, clinical outcomes and usefulness. It's also about whether or not they can reduce costs, increase productivity, and also uh, make uh, treatments more convenient for patients. And finally, uh, there's this issue about uh, uh, reimbursements, which I think would be a major barrier to the, ex the widespread implementation of most of these things. There's a short-term, long-term issue, the alignment of uh, incentives across different payors. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the long term, we need to align all these incentives 
in order to realize the potential and yet reap, and in addition reap the benefits of uh, cost effectiveness. So with that, I, I think you agree with me. We had a fabulous uh, set of contributions from uh, our distinguished panelists. I'd like to invite you to thank them in a traditional way. Thank you. Thanks.